Ladies and gentlemen, if you're hearing this, you have once again a tune in the consequence of have a podcast. You know, I, I, I've been struggling on, on how to even start this, the intro to this interview for a couple different reasons. One, because I'm a veteran and uh, I have on an admiral. I have a four-star general coming on this podcast and uh, full transparency, that, that intimidated me. I mean, I could go on about this, this, this gentleman's accolades for a long time, but it, it's missing the point of what this interview is about. Because all the stars and everything that this uh, this admiral has done, at the end of the day, he's he is where he is because he's a parent who unfortunately lost a son. He lost his son to addiction. He lost his son to a accidental overdose of fentanyl. So the one side of me wants to tell you, hey, I've got this. Uh, I've I've got retired Admiral James Winnefeld. Um, I mean, he was the ninth vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and since I was a low-ranking enlisted guy, uh, that's, that's a big deal. But again, if I, if I harp on that, then, then we are doing disservice to what he's trying to do right now. Shortly after losing his son, Admiral Winnefeld and, and his wife started a, a nonprofit. It's called the SAFE Project. The SAFE Project stands for Stop the Addiction Fatality Epidemic. Now, his, his past life in the military, uh, it's important because he comes in with a knowledge and, a, and an ability to lead. The front lines of his battle are, are right here and they're in our face all the time. We are reaching new highs in the amount of people that are dying from overdoses. And joining him in the, in the conversation today uh, is retired Captain Bill Penamont. Bill heads up the veteran section of the SAFE Project. I've been fortunate enough since this interview to, to have more interactions with Bill. I'm lucky enough that he lives close. Um, and this guy's got a, a unwavering passion to help veterans uh, dealing with with uh, substance misuse issues. You know, August thirty first. That is the date that this is coming out, and this is Overdose Awareness Day. Please support uh, the Safe Project. Uh, donate to them. Volunteer your time. Just check out the website. And without further ado, please welcome to the podcast retired Admiral James Winnefeld and Bill Penamont. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for tuning in to the Consequence of Habit podcast. Uh, this is an absolute honor. Today, I get to sit down with retired Admiral James Winnefeld and retired Captain, Navy Captain, Bill Pinamont. Uh, thank you guys so much for, for joining me here on the podcast. JT, it's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, really appreciate the mission you've taken on with Consequence of Habit. It's, it's terribly important, and uh, we're happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for saying that. I appreciate that. You know, the, the reason we're sitting here right now is to talk about the SAFE Project. And the SAFE Project is Stop the Addiction Fatality Epidemic. And if you could just go ahead and give us a, first a summary of what the SAFE Project is about and you know how your involvement in this uh, even came to be. Sure. Well, we are the, uh, uh, unfortunately, are joining hundreds of thousands of other Americans who've lost a loved one to uh, substance dependence. And our loved one was our youngest son, Jonathan, who uh, grew up as a wonderful kid in a, in a military family, uh, moved around a lot. Uh, at one point was in five different school districts in six years. And unlike his older brother, uh, developed a little bit of anxiety and depression from, you know, you can imagine showing up in a brand new lunchroom every year sure. and having to uh, contend with that, including, uh, you know, in Portugal, you know, that sort of thing. So Jonathan uh, was fighting um anxiety and depression. He was misdiagnosed as being ADHD and was prescribed Adderall, which is perhaps the, one of the worst things you can give to somebody who actually has anxiety. And John started uh, you know, sneaking some liquor out of our liquor cabinet in order to uh, come down from the Adderall at the end of the day. Long story short, one thing led to another. He ended up dependent on marijuana, alcohol, Xanax. And what we did not know at the time, he had also been using some opioids. Uh, over the course of a number of events in Jonathan's life, we decided that we could no longer keep him safe. So we uh, entered him into a treatment program that was, was actually very successful. Uh, we watched our son uh, recover. We watched his brain heal. And uh, we were very excited about that. He got his emergency medical technician qualification. He wanted to be a first responder, just like you've been. 
uh, and uh, we decided that uh, on his exit from treatment that he would become he would go to college because he wanted to be a paramedic fireman, and uh, to do that, it's helpful if you have a college degree. Uh, and unfortunately, we lost him on his fourth day of college. Uh, he relapsed uh, and um, got a, a dose of fentanyl laced heroin and he was found unresponsive the next morning. So in the wake of that, uh, my wife, Mary and I uh, had to make a choice. We could either crawl up into a little ball of anger, grief and shame, which we still do from time to time. Uh, or we could try with the connections we have with knowing how to get things done. Uh, the, some of the financial resources that friends can help us bring to bear. Uh, we could try to help solve this problem. And that's what we decided to do. And as you have experienced yourself, you, you look at what does it take to start a 501c3? Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, we, we were fortunate to be uh, taken under the wing of another 501c3 while we went through that process. And in the meantime, we started Safe Project, which began with our belief in, in six lines of operation that we think the country needs to do in order to uh, overcome this epidemic and has moved into how those six lines translate up into the four communities, including the one that Bill runs, which is Safe Veterans. But it's been a labor of love for the last almost four years now, uh, and we believe we're making progress hand in hand with a lot of other great organizations that are doing the same thing. You know, I'm sure you've been asked this question a thousand times, but the need for for the nonprofit side to bring awareness to a, a multifaceted problems of facing addiction. You know, it's not it's not just uh, the the pain pills, or it's it's. You know, there's policy that's involved. There's the stigma that's involved. There's the law enforcement response that's involved. Uh, this isn't an easy solution. Has have you seen a change within the past four years uh, since you've started this? Um, have you seen any anything drastic? Uh, well, we've seen things on both the positive side and the negative side. Uh, on the positive side, we've seen a gradual increase in awareness on the part of the public and public officials and, and the like uh, as to the real nature of this campaign. We are not even close to where we need to be yet in that regard. But, but I would say we have seen you know, people starting to wake up to the fact that we lost 93,000 people last year to this ep epidemic, and that's unacceptable. Uh, on the negative side, uh, we're, you know, first of all, COVID hurt a lot. Um, you know, there's a, a definite tie in many, if not most cases, between mental health and substance dependence. And COVID had a huge impact on mental health. Uh, anxiety, isolation, uh, you know, fear, those sorts of things only tend to amp up, uh, you know, me mental health cha challenges like anxiety. Coincident with that, we've seen a huge influx of fentanyl on the streets of the U.S. And, and fentanyl is, is making its way into a host of different drugs, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamines, and other uh, drugs out there that are, that people are using. And it's, it's killing. It's, it's, it's responsible largely for a major uptick in the death rate uh, for fatalities in our country. So, so we've seen a little bit of positive, but um, you know, one step forward and two steps back is, is what it feels like. And if I could, if I could add one of the positive programs that we've seen um, for veterans um, is the implementation of veteran courts. It's in some jurisdictions and in, in some states. Um, I've personally observed how effective they can be um, to divert uh, justice-involved veterans from uh, the criminal justice process, which would have normally um, resulted in incarceration. Um, but in some jurisdictions, um, they've adopted the, these programs, which allow uh, veterans who are in recovery um, and may have mental health challenges to um, rediscover their best self through uh, a program which gets them back on track for their life. So when it, when when I when I'm asked that question, what do I see in a community that is that is different um, than was ten years ago? Um, these diversionary programs, I think, are very positive. Um, and any jurisdiction that doesn't have one um, should consider developing one or adopting one and they can be used um for more than just veterans um so there's not not just veteran courts um uh folks everyday folks can uh should be should have the options of having diversionary court uh processes mm. yeah it's it's interesting thing as far as 
how the court systems are looking at this. Uh, you know, I think in, in my own mind, it, there's, there's a shame that comes along with whether it's justified or not irrelevant is, is irrelevant. The, the person feels a sense of shame. And, and then you add on a, uh, the, the, the disciplinary system that comes along with, with people that a lot of which are, are self-medicating. You know, Admiral, I've heard you talk about the, the, the three different pathways that kind of lead people down this, this world of addiction. Uh, if you could break those down for us. Sure, JT. The, the three pathways that I've spoken to in, in front of high school kids and others are, you know, the first is, is the sort of uh, injury path where, where you're given uh, uh, opioids uh, in, in response to either a physical injury or a dental procedure or something like that. And if you take enough of them, it's entirely possible that you could get uh, um, addicted fairly soon, depending on your genetic makeup and other factors. Uh, another pathway that I call the party pathway. Uh, uh, if you if you party enough and you start to use some of these drugs, uh, particularly when they're laced with things like fentanyl or others, you can become addicted as well. And then third is the mental health pathway, where uh, if you are um, feeling anxiety or depression and, and you take uh, some of these drugs, it makes you feel better. And it's very easy. We've seen a number of people with that uh, pathway. And I think one of the important things is, is these pathways intersect. Um, we used to have a young man, a remarkable young man working for us who was in incredibly successful in life, but also grew up with some anxiety. Well, this young man got an injury, was prescribed opioids for the pain. The pain went away after two or three days. It was really sure. a minor injury, but the opioids uh, really addressed his anxiety. So that was step one on, on his pathway to a very serious heroin addiction that he has since overcome and is now in long-term recovery. We're very proud of him. Uh, but but those pathways uh, have to be reckoned with uh, across the board. Has this, I, I mean, this almost seems like a, a silly question, but having dealt with this in your own life had to massively change even your own personal outlook on maybe what you grew up from. Because if, if I read correctly, you've come from a military, I mean, not just yourself in the military, but uh, your grandfather's, your grandfather was in the military. This is not something uh, from my experiences in the military that um, you looked at, sure, everyone drank. Everyone drank a bunch, and, and that was a coping mechanism, uh, whether you want to admit it or not. But when it came to things like drugs, there was that stigma. When it came to things like mental health, there was that stigma. And getting back to what Bill was, uh, was talking about for the veteran courts, you know, this thing of dealing with trauma and anxiety and depression when we put it into just, hey, this is the human condition. This is not a veteran thing. This is not a civilian thing. This is across the board. And the, and the deaths show it, right? Everyone is, it's, uh, the amount of people that are dying from this is, um, well, it's tragic. So, yeah. So JT, the, the, the real question you had was how, how has, it, has it changed me? And I can tell you, it's been a fairly massive change, uh, uh, principally, uh, you know, prior to any of this happening, I was probably carrying some stigma about drug use. It's like, hey, who are these people? And I had the same vision that is produced by a lot of um, visual, you know, the uh, photojournalism of, of people who, who aren't anything like me at all who were suffering from this. Well, in fact, as you know, most of the victims actually kind of do look like me. Uh, and what I learned along the way was that this is a disease, not a moral failing. And I also learned a lot more about the science of addiction. What really is happening inside your brain when you become dependent on drugs? And that's really important to, to understand, to help you understand why it's a disease, but also help to understand the recovery process. Mm. And then watching it happen in my own family, uh, obviously heartbreaking, but a real education uh, it, when you look back in retrospect at what was really happening to Jonathan. Uh, and we often on our sixth line of operation, which is family outreach and support, I define that by saying, if I only knew then what I know now, I would still have my son with me. And so there's a real educational aspect uh, to what's really happening with this epidemic. Could you break down the, the, the other lines of the, uh, the, the pillars to that? Uh, cause I, I've heard you speak about them and I really want to get to the, the meat eaters and leaf eaters one, because I think for, <laughs> I think it's really important. Sure. Um, the, uh, the, the six uh, lines of operation are, are fairly broad. And, and as you know, this is a, a terribly complex problem. 
and there's no one lever uh, that will you know, magically solve it. Uh, and, and all of these levers have to work together. They're not just independent in their stovepipe. So the first one for us is public awareness, which is about lowering stigma, uh, which is why we have a great program called Reverse the Silence and, and uh, No Shame uh, Pledges and things like that. Uh, and that will uh, take care of public enemy number one of this crisis, which is stigma. And it will also, hopefully in the process, get more resources uh, dedicated to all of the many different levers that have to be pulled to solve this. So that's one. Number two is full spectrum prevention, which is a large topic, but for, for a safe project, it's mostly about the most credible voices talking to the most vulnerable audiences, you know, telling us, uh, uh, letting kids live vicariously through our experience uh, a story of loss, Jonathan's story of loss, and also to live through a story of hope, uh, of recovery, that you can actually get through this. And, and if you're not stigmatized and if you confront it, uh, there, there's, you, can, you can recover. So that's number two. Number three is essentially prescription medicine and medical response, both getting you know, doctors and dentists and others to more responsibly prescribe opioids when they do. Uh, and to warn people about the hazards all the way through uh, making the overdose reversing drug naloxone more available and also making the craving reducing drug buprenorphine more available. You know, it's easier for a doctor to prescribe an opioid than it is to prescribe buprenorphine, which is a shame. So a lot involved there. Third one, as you have alluded to, is, is law enforcement and justice. Uh, we aren't going to arrest our way out of this problem. Uh, you know, the FBI will tell you that 85% of the people who are arrested in this country for a drug offense are users, not dealers. Uh, and also, as Bill uh, so uh, well mentioned, you know, the justice system, uh, whether, you know, drug courts, veteran drug courts, and also helping people who are incarcerated uh, overcome their substance dependence. That's a very important line. The next one is treatment and recovery. A uh, huge uh, lack of resources in our country for treatment. A lot of those treatment programs are too short. You cannot heal this brain in 60 days. It takes longer than that, and that takes money, and it takes capacity. Uh, and then once that recovery is sort of on track, that treatment is, is complete, and now you're putting somebody into long-term recovery, they need a place to live very often, and there's not enough of that. So we're working very hard. We have a, an application on our website where you can find treatment facilities. We're building one to help you find recovery facilities. But that's, that's number five. And number six, of course, is family outreach and support, which I just mentioned. Mm. Uh, and we're trying to connect families who have a loved one in trouble with the resources they need in order to figure this thing out. Uh, because, again, uh, if we knew then what we know now, we'd still have our son. Sure. So those are the sort of six lines. And they're, they feed up into the four sort of main audiences we have, which are safe communities, safe campuses, safe workplaces, and Bill runs safe veterans for us. The, uh, the, the cost on these things. So when I first started Consequence of Habit, I had this, this, uh, this idea. I said, we're going to sponsor people who, who couldn't afford to get help. Maybe they don't have insurance. And, and I had this grand idea. And then I found out how much it cost. And I was blown away. I said, well, if I have you know, $30,000, we got to help. How many people can we help? They said, you can help maybe one for 30 days. And I was, I was shocked on the price. Of the, the, of it's these about facilities. the right number. That's what we were paying for Jonathan. We, we, what, what cost us, and, and we were very fortunate as a family to be able to afford this. We had to scrape to do it. But we essentially paid the equivalent of a four-year Harvard education. Uh, in the 15 months that Jonathan was in treatment and it worked. We just didn't get the transition right yeah. out of treatment. Cause that's a very dangerous time for somebody who's been using opioids. You told a story about Jonathan uh, riding on the ambulance. And I think, I think it's, it's an important one. I think there's a, uh, as I'm listening to it, um, I had a lot of thoughts on it. If, if you could just uh, tell that story and, and, uh, I'm sure. Just, uh, Jonathan, uh, you know, wanted to be, do something important that was different from the rest of his family. So he decided that he wanted to be an emergency medical technician. So he started doing that while he was in treatment and he actually earned his qualification while he was in treatment. When he started at University of Denver, uh, that uh, university requires every incoming freshman to write an essay. They have to read a book and write an essay before they actually matriculate in the fall. And the question posed uh, in 2017 to these freshmen was, who has had the most impact on your life? And of course, I would like to think as a dad, you know, it was me. But Jonathan writes this unbelievably compelling and well-written essay 
that talks about uh, being on an ambulance ride while he's getting his EMT qual, finding himself on the floor of a bathroom of a McDonald's in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, basically saving the life of a man undergoing a heroin overdose. And thinking at the time, and this is Jonathan talking, you know, I'm thinking, what if this guy has a family? What if he doesn't make it through the night? You know, what, you know, what is that going to feel like for them? And I, and he, he says, I decided right then and there to devote my life to helping people who can't help themselves. Uh, and so that's why he, he wanted to you know, continue a career in, in that field. And that was super powerful for his family to read this. It's like, you know, mm. he's finished his treatment. He's written this essay. He looks great. Touchdown. You know, our son is back. And little did we know how vulnerable he was to a relapse at that point. And in fact, it happened. Yeah, there, there's that. There's an important message in the fact that it's not it's not like a, 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 a you flip a switch and all of those other things go away, regardless of, of really how long you're in treatment. But there certainly is an important transition period. And when you told that story and I listened to it the first time, I just thought of there's an empathy that somebody has that's been through those scenarios that you, you, you cannot find it. It's very hard to instill that in somebody who hasn't felt it. Uh, just like yourself, you know, after John, Jonathan's passing, you start this organization. And I, what I found is that there's, there's two groups of people. There's people that have gotten through the dark periods and there's a, there's a, a moral obligation to help others get through that. And then others who, who unfortunately have lost a loved one who, in some ways, they feel a moral obligation to help other people's not other people to not have to feel that type of pain. Uh, yeah. That story really struck me when I, when I heard you say it. Um, well, there's a very important point that's related to what you just said, and it involves one of our programs that we call Bridging Prevention and Recovery. The long time the prevention community uh, really didn't want much to do with the recovery community. Hey, I'm trying to keep kids away from this stuff. I don't need somebody talking to them who's been using drugs before, even if they're in recovery. Yeah. You know, you know, cover that whole thing with stigma, right? Well, what you find, uh, and and a very precious resource. in in resolving this crisis is people who have that empathy, who have been through that. And they can be remarkable speakers. I mean, powerful speakers in a prevention effort. So if the, if the prevention folks can overcome their stigma and bring the recovery people in, they just gained a huge resource in the process. Yeah. It's, it's strange because, you know, I've even told people, Hey, I quit drinking. I stopped drinking and I did it through a program. I did it through a 12 step, a traditional 12 step. And, and a lot of people say, whoa, man, that's, that's, some, that's hardcore. And those same people will reach out after you and go, uh, when you're by yourself and go, you know, how did you do it? And when they end up finding, um, that this thing, they're not a slave to it anymore. Man, you just want to scream from the mountaintops and, and, and get as many people to join you, uh, along the ride. Because for so many people, it just feels that there is no hope. There is no, once you're in it, you need to be surrounded by people who have 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 navigated their way through these these dark periods. Um, yeah, that's why when we we would speak to high schools, uh, I would tell John's story, and you could you could see the kids sitting on the edge of their seat because it sounds so much like so many people they know or even themselves. And then we brought in this very successful young man who had gone to college, had worked for a, a Wall Street company, uh, and had had anxiety. And the mental health connection with opioids, you know, kind of took him down. And he tried to to uh, um, get out of that. He says forty some different times, intense pain with painful withdrawal. Forty, and finally went into treatment, was successful in treatment. And when he stands in front of those kids and says, "The worst mistake I ever made was when the guy like me was standing in front of the audience. I didn't listen to him because I, I was telling myself this could never happen to me." Well, I'm telling you, it can happen to anybody and the kids are like transfixed. Sure. So telling that story of loss and the story of hope is, is a pretty powerful combination. And then you mix that in with a little science because the kids like to hear the science of what's going on in their brains. They don't want to be told, you know, you're just an idiot if you do this. You know, just just say no. Right. You know, they don't want to hear that. They want to know the why behind the what. Uh, and that's where the science piece comes in. Yeah, I think the science is important for a couple different reasons. One, just just to say, hey, if you do this for so many days, uh, it's expected that you're going to feel a sense of dependency. That this is this is not a it's not a lack of character. 
because you can't stop doing something. There is a, there is a physical addiction that comes along with these things. Um, so to, to take that, that whole thing of, of um, you're just not disciplined, you should be better. I mean, that's part of the stigma, right? I mean, that's, that's really part of the problem. Um, how have you seen, and then I guess this is a question for you, Bill, on the veteran side, um, you know, post 9-11, we've been dealing with mental health, mental health issues with, with our veterans for a long time. And we know that that goes hand in hand in hand with, with, uh, substance misuse issues. Um, other than the courts, what type of progress are we making in, in that area? Progress in the support area. Is that what you, is that the question? So, yeah, um, support, uh, recovery, uh, stigma. Well, as the Admiral mentioned, um, we implemented bridging prevention and recovery in our programs and what we do at safe project, um, for veterans, we have both prevention programs and support for recovery programs. So we do both. Um, and when it comes to providing uh, support directly to veterans, we're available. We make ourselves available just as we were talking about before the Admiral got on the call. Sure. Um, we have, Every Thursday night, we do virtual veterans. Uh, we have folks from all over the country that participate. Um, they get the chance to connect with folks who have gone through the same experiences, people who um, understand what it means to be in the military service. They understand what it means to be transferred to Portugal, um, have to change schools, um, have to change their entire life, um, and then also um, you know, get used to a, a completely new um, culture. Um, these kinds of stressors uh, are normalized by most veterans, and all of our programming um, addresses this very issue. The idea that we are normalizing something that is really, truly extraordinary. Even if you only ever were sent to Fort Dix, I say only, your, your only duty station was Fort Dix, and you were sent to boot camp, um, and you served your four years, um, and then uh, were discharged, you still had an extraordinary experience. Mm. So we try to raise that um, as if that's a fundamental element of all of our programming. Um, let folks understand these, the issues that they're facing, um, and then offer them ideas for coping um, that they can choose. Um, because we certainly aren't about preaching. Um, as you, you, you talk, the Admiral will talk about and folks in Safe Project will talk about, here are some ideas. Um, and our, our whole intention is to give folks information so that they can make decisions and inform their life. Um, that's really the essential elements of veteran wellness, which is one of our very um, unique programs that we have to thank um, uh, Wounded Warrior Project for the grant that helped, mm. uh, helped us do that research. But, um, you know, the element of veteran wellness is here are some ideas. These are the stressors that you have internalized. You need to be aware of them. Um, now, here are some coping strategies um, and here are some ways to uh, address the, the challenges in your life. Um, so I think um, from Safe Project's perspective, we're, we're making strides. Um, and in, in bringing this incredibly uh, good programming uh, to folks um, around the country. Um, but, you know, nationwide, as the Admiral said, there's, it's, we get, we go two steps forward and then there's, there's a, you know, one step forward and then there are two steps back. Do you think there's a lack of connection between the mental health side and the, the substance misuse side it, it, it is, I would just think that when, when those connections are made and they're kind of put on the forefront, it, it makes a lot more sense that, uh, to, to people that haven't experienced it before. They, they, they understand that people deal with anxiety. They understand people deal with depression. Uh, you add in, you add in uh, substances, and, and for whatever reason, that adds a lot more stigma to it. Um, is that just a packaging that, that, that we're missing out on? Is it a policy? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that are the stigma... Uh, when it's specifically for military folks, 
Um, and it, it's to the, to a large extent, the same thing uh, applies to uh, civilian folks. But for military folks, when you come into the service, um, the laws that the laws and regulations that apply to military service um, are very clear. Um, and they require a higher standard. So there are policies such as zero tolerance. Sure. There are policies that are that are in place that are that underline underlie the requirements related to security clearances. There are policies and laws and rules in in place for medical boards. All of these things have to do with fitness for duty. Um, and the and the the. The, the problem is that fitness for duty also involves the determinations related to um, mental health, emotional well-being, substance use, alcohol use, um, and men, and many on many in many occasions these these issues can be um, the grounds for uh, administrative separation or even criminal criminal charges against against uh, military members. So, and what we're seeing is. Uh, military folks who are becoming more aware of the connection between substance use um, and alcohol use and mental health challenges, because I actually even saw something just the other day from a military leader on active duty right now who was saying mental health is your health. Overall health is mental health. Um, And that, and this, these are the, this is one of the most important things that we have to deal with. So there is an awareness and, folks are addressing these issues, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's institutional to a large extent. Uh, the Admiral mentioned it, uh, um, when it comes to the communities that w- where we live, uh, you've got laws and medical standards that come into play. Um, and, uh, it makes it much more difficult for folks to just raise their hand and say, um, you know, I need help. Um, uh, and these are, these are the problems that I'm, that I'm facing. These are the, these are the challenges that I'm trying to uh, correct. That, that is, uh, as clear as could be within the, those military communities, the law enforcement communities. Uh, one of the programs, uh, Admiral is the, is, is the workforce side. Um, can you explain a little bit about that? And, and I think it, it it speaks to something even on, on the on the military side and, and the lack of uh, volunteers to raise their hand to admit that they've got a problem. Sure. Um, first of all, about sixty uh, percent of the people in our country who are struggling with substance dependence are in the workforce, <laughs> and very often the workforce doesn't the, the the workplace doesn't understand that, and they're and they're coping. You know, they're they're functioning alcoholics, fun- functioning substance dependent people. Uh, but they're they're at risk uh, to, of them to themselves in the workplace. They're they're risk to others, uh, and they're also at, at the the rest of risk that you experience when you're undergoing that that very difficult situation. And so, what we try to do uh, is um, help businesses understand the potential level of of uh, substance dependence in their business, and we developed a actually a, a, uh, an algorithm to, to help them uh, understand, you know, what is, the, how many people working in your business are likely struggling with substance dependence? And it's, it's a, a pretty surprising to people when you show that to them. And then, uh, you know, without being too interventionist uh, in this, it's, it's more like, let's, let's try to provide you with as many resources as we can to help you as a business cope with this. And it's really, it's really up to the business. It's almost like a Chinese menu we will give you powerful signage that encourages you, for example, to uh, have a powerful conversation with your doctor if, if, or dentist if you're being prescribed opioids, to encourage you to dispose responsibly of, of, uh, of pain medications and, um, and to seek help if you need it for a mental health issue uh, and you know, trying to lower the stigma. The, all those sorts of things, we, we provide uh, drug disposal bags uh, to, um, or at least either provide them directly or give the, the business an opportunity so that these guys can go home and clean out their medicine cabinets. Cause you know, there's a, uh, you know, th- I think three in five people who become dependent on opioids started in their medicine cabinet uh, uh, you know, or somebody else's medicine cabinet. So, so doing whatever we can to help um, the workplaces, uh, 
um, you know, get the, get a grip on helping their workforce as best they can. They, they realize it's, it's to their benefit to do so. And we've got some good partners. We've got Athletico, which is a physical therapy group. We've got Alliance Laundry Systems, uh, which makes a, you know, a huge factory in Ripon, Wisconsin that makes washers and dryers and the Cox Media Group uh, down in Atlanta, based in Atlanta. And these are sort of our pilot projects so that we can learn how to most effectively do this. But we're very excited because uh, this is potentially very impactful on a nationwide basis. I, I think it's it's a huge part of this overall uh, problem. I think that when people, whatever your career is, uh, be, because there are so many jobs out there where this is looked at as a weakness or or even worse, this is something that maybe compromise your position uh, in your actual workplace. I talk to pilots. I've talked to lots of different positions. And, and at any time I can get in front of a leader of, of any group, and I said, if it's not for if it's not because you care about your employees, if it's just for their own performance and their own, you know, when, when somebody's with of a, of a healthy mind and they're feeling better, um, they're just making sound decisions. You know, within the law enforcement, firefighter, uh, career fields, man, there are so many people struggling right now that are working crazy shifts, and and they are, um, they are 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 self-medicating and everything that comes along with that when it comes to decision-making on the job. And we've seen what happens. It's a, it's, it's, it's a real problem. So I would love to see um, some, some positive movement in that direction. Certainly. Uh, One of the programs I wanted to talk about was, is the unpacking your emotional ruck. Can you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Sure. Unpacking your emotional ruck is one of our, um, most successful veteran, um, programs. Um, we've, we've partnered with a number of universities around the country to offer, um, it in different, in different lengths. So it, it comes in three different versions. It can be a day long seminar. It can be a two or three hour session, or it can be a one hour lunch and learn. And, uh, we, we have different, uh, different amounts of information that are included in, in each one of these, um, um, programs or sessions. Um, we're happy to say that we're partnering with the Stephen A. Cohen military family clinics, uh, around the country to provide, uh, semin- these seminars to military connected folks. And I, and I would, I would add that, um, our veterans programs, we, I'm safe project veterans, but, but our programs are not just for veterans. Um, we are, we, uh, define veterans as military connected folks. So for example, if you're, um, if you're taking care of your grandfather who was a Korean war veteran, but you never served, um, but you feel that from your experience, um, you have a military connection. Um, we would more than we, we would more than encourage you to participate in our programs because it, it's very relevant to to uh, to you and what you're doing, taking care of uh, this uh, your your grandfather who's a veteran. In fact, in a recent ser- seminar that I participated in at a Cohen Clinic, um, we had a mother, uh, elderly woman, who was taking care of her. Uh, son who was a West Point graduate who had struggled with uh, his service in Iraq um, and also um, the post-traumatic stress that he had developed. Uh, And she was uh, profoundly affected by um, his service and what had happened to him. Uh, And she found our seminar, Unpacking Your Emotional Rock, to be very helpful. Um, So as I said, um, this particular uh, seminar comes in a various um, uh, lengths. We adapt it to uh, give it the opportunity to be available um, to various groups. Um, one of our uh, great partners is the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic, as I said. Um, and we expect, by the way, I'll keep your eye out on Eventbrite for um, several uh, more uh, scheduled sessions, which all are welcome to attend, as I said. Um, and we're looking, we'll be in San Antonio. Uh, we'll be in Clarksville, Tennessee, probably sometime in the near future. Denver, Colorado, again, uh, which we, we recently were in Denver, Colorado, and we're talking to folks in Anchorage, Alaska as well. So I'm not sure to what extent your podcast gets um, exposure. But um, in addition to those locations, we also are working with 
colleges and universities around the country. Um, and we'll be doing breakfast and learns and lunch and learns uh, at uh, these schools, which are um, and through the Veteran Resource Center. Um, the Veteran Resource Centers that are rated as high, high uh, quality by military friendly. Uh, we usually try to reach out to those uh, veteran resource centers first. Um, and we're, and I'm happy to say that um, we've had good, good luck and good res response from uh, these uh, partners. Uh, so um, we're also uh, touching base and, and getting our message um, out through the veteran resource centers on campuses across the country, awesome. which is very exciting. Yeah. Have you seen a shift within the VA itself as, as over the past couple of years as how they're looking at this or maybe even how that they're uh, reacting to it? I have. In fact, I just had dinner not too long ago with the director of the veteran VA Medical Center in Denver, Colorado. Um, and he is very aware of, of um, and very sensitive to how, how the VA is perceived and and what they would like uh to accomplish as as you may know the the, the va medical center in denver is probably the state-of-the-art medical center in the country for veterans um and i had the privilege of getting a a, a tour of that facility by the director of the of the veterans administration uh medical center and he um he, he's very proud of the, of the center and he's very interested in safe project and what we're doing. Um, and, um, I'm hoping that, you know, we'll continue our conversation uh, about, um, how safe project can can, uh, help him accomplish the mission. Uh, and I do see that the, the VA is interested in, in partnering with, uh, with safe project. And as you may know, we already have partnerships with, with uh, several uh, VA hospitals um, for the Be Safe campaign, which sure. the Admiral mentioned it. It's our signage campaign, which helps folks um, just raise awareness as to what, what the risks are associated with the treatment options that are, that are available to them. JT, I would, I would pile on by saying uh, we're very fortunate in having a VA secretary, Dennis McDonough, who is a former board member at Safe Project. Now, obviously, when he was confirmed and assumed his job, he had to, you know, disconnect and that sort of thing. But but uh, he had the opportunity to see and hear hear what we're all about, and to you know, just like all of us, learn about how this crisis really uh, exists. And I think that it'll help help him as he carries that knowledge into his job. Now he's got an awful lot on his plate. <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the one bureaucracy in our country that it, uh, seems to have no shortage of problems. But but he'll take that knowledge in with him. And Dennis is a terrific leader. And uh, hopefully we'll see the uh, Veterans Administration really dive into this. Yeah, I think we've seen a big shift, even with the, some of the other uh, veteran nonprofits of, of you know, you, you mentioned uh, leaf eaters to meat eaters, but but the, just people using methods uh to to help maintain their mental health that, that weren't used before within those communities whether it be a meditation or um or even the, even seeking therapy where that was kind of frowned upon um i, I think there's there's a lot of uh, things moving forward in, the, in that area that are going to be a huge help and um yeah, everyone i've talked to i said hey, listen they they were the va's been very well intentioned it's just change takes a long time in those areas it's just it's, it's like anything it's slow moving no, you're right. And, and, you know, a few years ago, um, I know Admiral Mullen, when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, made a very big point of, um, particularly with all of the traumatic brain injury and PTSD that was coming home from overseas, that, you know, if you have a mental health problem, speak up. You know, we're not going to allow this to impact your career. Now, that's a huge hurdle, right? Uh, on, on both sides of that equation, it's a huge hurdle for somebody to have the trust in the system oh, that if yes. they speak up, that they're not going to get hammered. Yes. And it's a, frankly, a huge hurdle to convince the system itself that, that this is right and true. And it's almost to the point where unless you're tired of hearing yourself say it as a leader, you're not saying it enough uh, because you, because you may believe it, but you've got to get this deeply uh, embedded in the culture for people to really get it. Yeah. It really is a cultural shift. You know, that, 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 that thing of, uh, of saying, hey, it's an injury, it's a brain injury. Everyone understands what a broken leg looks like. They don't understand what, um, 
dealing with mental health. It, it, they're just a lot of times not as empathetic or not as understanding of, of how long, so a point you made of, of how long these changes take. You know, this yeah. is not, this is not a fast process. One of the things that we, you know, Mary and I just had the opportunity to participate in an event for the Olympics um, that was thanking donors and in particular donors who had don- uh, given to the Paralympic games. Uh, and, you know, we learned uh, starting in, I think, 2010 when we were out of North Common NORAD, which is where the Olymp- one of the Olympic training centers is located, the main one in, in uh, Colorado Springs, uh, where the Warrior Games began. You know, and, and if you're familiar with that, you know, each service had a team. It was there was an opening ceremony with a flame and there were all these events. And it not only was a great recruiting ground for the uh, Olympic uh, committee, um, but it, it was a huge benefit to their uh, health, to their health, mental health. Uh, athletics can not only make you feel better, uh, but it, it gives you goals you can achieve. And as you achieve those goals, however minor they might be, and uh, you know, those are your gold medals as, as sort of the average bear who's, who's afflicted with a, a, a physical injury that translates also into a mental injury uh, that is tremendous for your mental health. And then when you can have competition, uh, I, I haven't had many more than one of these Paralympic uh, athletes, one of these Warrior Games athletes come up to me and say, this program saved my life uh, because I was with people who were like me, who've been through the same thing I've been through, and they're struggling in the same way that I am. And uh, being on this team with them literally kept me from doing something very, very stupid. So there, you know, there are all kinds of great programs out there that we just need to put a, you know, breathe a lot of life into to help people who are struggling. Uh, um, and rather than stigmatize them, let's help them. It's that connection, you know, and it's that connection. And then I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate because a lot of these rooms uh, where traditionally people might meet that are dealing with um, like a 12 step program, they're, they're tucked away in, in a church somewhere or a small room. And it's this bubble and, it, the only time you would see something about that would be if you watched a movie, right? And you see it, but it's those connections of, of one opening that up and making and saying, Hey, this isn't just, you know, the guy down the road who goes to these meetings there, the amount of people that are suffering that should be going to these meetings or putting it out there that it is not a weakness. The weakness is to continue doing the same thing over and over you know, I compared it to being murdered with a wiffle ball bat. It just takes a really long time that, you know, if it's that strength of, of really telling people and, and um, praising them when they do raise their hands and say, hey, I have an issue because that is, you have to be courageous to do that. That wasn't a question. Yeah, that was just my, that was my soapbox. No, I, I have violent agreement uh, with that. Uh, and, and, you know, whenever we are around someone who, and announces themselves as being in long-term recovery, give them a round of applause wow. and, you know, congratulations. Uh, and, you know, we're very blessed with uh, uh, an executive director who is in long-term recovery. She's a force of nature. She's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, she has um, dedicated her life to helping people uh, and we've, we've put her in a position to do it. <laughs> yeah. Admiral, before we go, uh, one last question. You, you had mentioned even with your son of dealing with some mental health issues when he was younger. Um, what would you say to parents now, if you, if you see a child who's maybe been suffering with some mental health issues, what would, what would be some advice you would give them? Um, there's, there's a ton of advice and I hope I can remember it all. Um, first of all, if, if it's a mental health issue, such as anxiety or depression or something just doesn't seem right, obviously you should seek help. Uh, and it needs to be real professional help. Uh, and, you know, counselors are counselors. They can help a little bit, but a real professional psychologist is, uh, is, you know, priceless. And we have, we went through this with Jonathan. We, he had a good counselor. He would go see him and all that, but he had that guy totally fooled. Uh, the psychologist got more out of John in 20 minutes than anybody ever got out of him before in his life. <laughs> now, um, I would also say it doesn't hurt to get a second opinion, uh, you know, sometimes people will misdiagnose kids and, and there's a real tendency in the drug companies are pushing Adderall. Uh, so, you know, there's a real tendency out there to misdiagnose some things as happened to Jonathan. So get a second opinion. Another very important thing for parents to do is don't let hope become a strategy. Mm. We all have this curious, uh, wonderful tendency to want to believe in our kids that, you know, okay, I've, I talked to them, 
they understand it. Now they're okay. They're good to go. Uh, they're going to be fine. Well, chances are that if you think things are bad, they're probably a lot worse than you actually think they are. Yeah. So, so seeking, uh, you know, be acting aggressively before there's a problem, understanding who their friends are, really digging into it. And, and they don't like that. Kids don't like that. Right. But we have, a, a, there's something that uh, uh, one of Jonathan's friends said to us uh, uh, a while back that really makes a lot of sense. And that was, I'd rather step on their toes than step on their grave. Mm. Uh, so sometimes you have to, you know, be tough with that. Uh, and uh, if you need help, you've got to go get it. And then, then the, the last thing I would say is learn as much as you possibly can about this disease. Uh, there are a lot of subtleties and nuances about how the brain goes through this process, how it recovers during this process, uh, and a host of other things that you just have to, to put in the, you know, the grunt work to learn. And when you learn it, your eyes start to open and you, you start to really understand what's happening and how you can best help uh, someone who's in trouble. So, Awesome. Well, gentlemen, I, uh, I appreciate you very much coming on here. There, there's a million podcasts out there. Uh, so you're, you're always taking a risk when you, when you agree to come on one. Uh, if somebody wants to learn more about uh, the SAFE project, how do they go about doing it? Is Just explain the website and what the process is. Sure. We've got a great website, uh, safeproject.us. That's all one word, safeproject.us. And you can, you can snorkel through that thing and find almost anything you want uh, it, that will allow you to uh, find a resource, to learn something, uh, to be inspired, uh, a whole host of things. But we, uh, we heartily encourage that. And on that website, some of the resources are the treatment locator that we've got. Uh, we also have a, a safe campuses program. That's a whole new, whole, whole different aspect of this crisis we haven't talked about, but we uh, have a, a web application, for example, for people who graduate from those programs and sort of fall off the edge of a cliff when they leave their nice warm community in their campus to try to stay connected with, with other people who are in the same circumstances they are. So a host of resources. Uh, and uh, so we'd encourage people to visit safeproject.us. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And I'll make sure all that stuff is in the, in the show notes. Um, yeah. I really appreciate Jay, your time. You know what? They can call me. Call me. 610-529-3417. Bill Pinamont. Bill Pinamont at safeproject.us. If you are a veteran and you need help, call me. I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> We're nothing if not responsive. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> I, we, we respond. You, you will get a call back from me if you call me. Wow. Well, Bill, I, I, I think you and I are going to be talking some more here soon. Uh, we're going to join forces here. And uh, Admiral, I, I'm down in D.C. quite a bit, so I, I'll, I'll hit you up one of these times. I really, I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing and, and um, keep up the, the, the amazing work. Thank you, JT, and thanks for what you're doing as well. It's very important. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's a wrap. Huge thanks to retired Admiral James Winnefeld and retired Captain Bill Pinamont for coming on the podcast. Keep on doing what you guys are doing. This is insanely important work. Today is August 31st. And uh, like I said in the intro, this is uh, National Overdose uh, Awareness Day. So this stuff's relevant, man. Make sure you check out the safeproject.us. And that's it. I'll catch you guys next week.